Okay, I'm to uh, talk about a book that I've just written, which should be out in March. And one of the problems of that is that I'm trying to uh, put a whole book into 40 minutes. So, Adriana, please do um, give me the appropriate signs for me to finish at the right time. Actually, reminds me, I was once giving a talk in Ireland and I, for their... Uh, Organization, which is um, the shelter deals with homeless people, and their um, their director was Mary McAleish, who at the, had been. She set it up, and then she became the president of Ireland. Uh, but essentially, I was giving the talk before the president of Ireland to this conference, and I was told it was really, really bad manners to um, to keep her waiting. So I was giving my presentation and there was somebody in front of me and every so often they would go kind of go like that for me to uh, to finish up. And then apparently she was looking around some exhibition um, outside. When she stopped at somewhere, he then said, you know, take it easy, calm down, slow down. And, and then, but then after a while she sped up and came to the door. So I got the kind of finish now quickly halfway through the sentence so if you do that to it agile i'm used to it so <laughs> so there's no problem anyway um what i'm going to do hopefully is talk about this book in habitation in nature and it really comes from um an interest which i've had for a long time in the links between houses and nature and it's, uh, God, I'm getting old, but I was a member of the Friends of the Earth in 1968, I think, as far back as that. So it, it has been a recurring interest of mine, I suppose. And I'm at my happiest on the top of a mountain with nobody else around. Um, so it, it's been a, a recurring interest and, and realized more and more as I've gone into it, how it is to the study of housing. That it is, I hope I can argue for you, that it's impossible to study housing without studying all of the different elements that are involved in it, um, studying what I'll define as nature with a capital N, which is everything which includes people, uh, animals, and materials. That is, I will argue, nature. So housing, I will argue, is part of nature. And if we're studying housing, we're studying nature. And when we come to do things like evaluating housing policy, which I've uh, tried to do myself over many years, we use ideas like well-being uh, and so on, capabilities, um, but they're all human-based. Why are they human-based? And it seems the, very strange in a field like housing, where essentially it's about the relationship between humans, and I would argue animals, and a material basis of the house. Yet, actually, we know very little about that relationship. And there's actually very little research on that relationship. Now, architects will tell me, if Flora uh, was here, she would say, architects have been doing this for years, and so on, so we know all about it. And I accept that in the sense that architects have been concerned about that. But I think my concern with the work that has been done by architects and others is that they've lacked a kind of systematic way of looking at that relationship. So my question is, why is it not a more central part of housing studies? And to do that, I want to put forward four propositions. And these propositions get more controversial as they go on. Each of them is not original. They're just picking up on, on uh, um, areas of thought, concepts that are already there. Um, but I think if you put the, all of the four together, it has the potential to completely rewrite the agenda of housing studies, as well as rename it and re refocus housing studies. So what are these four propositions? Firstly, that Houses and the people that live in them are important elements of nature rather than separated from it. 
Humans are not distinct from nature. Houses are not distinct from nature. They are part of it. And I'll go through and, and give more detail on that. And I want to put forward the idea of inhabitation as being a concept which should be at the core of what we call housing studies. And then want to put forward uh, the idea of studying that relationship um, through the idea of practices, building on the work of Giddens and Borgia and others as a way of bringing together all of the different elements, the animal, human, and material elements that are involved in living, uh, consuming, and producing houses or shelters. And then, perhaps the most controversial bit, it is that uh, putting forward a holistic research approach to actually look at that kind of relationship. And to do that, I use the work of Ken Wilber, who's a very controversial, uh, um, I'm not exactly sure where, philosopher, but uh, uh, an environmental philosopher. Um, but I'll get, get on to argue that. And, and I think in a multidisciplinary field like this, it um, opens some important questions. So I hope I can take you along with me and all of these four propositions. If I can't, I hope I will stimulate uh, some uh, reactions, some comment, and, and uh, some thought. So houses as part of nature. It's, in some ways, it shouldn't really need saying, should it? But we seem to like distinctions and dichotomies in everything we do, don't we? We do the study of anything up into different disciplines based on different ways of thinking and, and different ideas of what is science or art or whatever. Um, and we seem to have got this kind of distinction between humans and nature. Somehow we define nature as somewhere we go and travel to. Uh, we go and see the sites. Um, and it's... it's uh, um, different from cities. So this thing we make between the urban and, and the rural, for example. But it doesn't take very much to break down those distinctions once you actually start looking at them. I have the, the pleasure to live uh, in one of the so-called wild areas in, in Europe. So I live on the Isle of Skye in, in Scotland. And outside my house, I have deer roaming. I have moorland. I'm just by the sea, there are dolphins, there are seals in that sea. But essentially, that isn't a really man-made landscape. Because why are there so many deer? Well, there are so many deer because humans have killed off the, um, the animals which actually predated the deer. But once you've got deer in a particular location, the area um, used to, didn't used to be more land, it used to be totally forested. But of course, now the deer, because they have those nat natural predators, they actually eat all of the vegetation. All of the vegetation has disappeared. Um, and now they have to be killed by humans to keep them under control. And of course, if you've got no vegetation, you've got no soil, so the soil is disintegrating. So the whole environment is being degraded um, by the intervention by the networks, if you like, humans, animals, and materials. And I'm using those terms to equate to nature. They're not uh, distinguishable, those categories, necessarily. Humans are also material, they're also animals. Um, but I just use it to give the idea of the kind of breadth of what nature's about. So we tend to think of that natural environment as being different from cities. The last time I saw a fox, was in the middle of Glasgow. Um, cities are actually full of animals. They're full of, uh, obviously, materials uh, like concrete. Uh, they, are man they are also made in terms of this relationship between humans, animals, and materials. So why do we need any kind of distinction uh, between them? And if you make these distinctions, it seems to me it makes it more difficult to analyze those relationships. 
So if we break down those distinctions, we think about what we're actually analyzing is nature, then it seems to me we've got an important way forward. And I think we've had some real um, I hope about that relationship recently as it's come into our idea of housing, more traditional forms of housing. COVID is a classic example of the research which shows that um, the incidence of COVID is, a very, is much higher in new settlements where you get new human settlements into previously wild environments. You get a disruption of uh, animal behaviors. You get more interaction between humans and animals and you get uh, a passing over of viruses between them. Uh, climate change, uh, bushfires in Australia, as uh, some colleagues have pointed out to me, another example of where uh, that relationship becomes serious. But it's not just about um, that. It is about more mundane things as well. We bring animals into our houses. Uh, houses are full of animals and uh, plants, uh, some of which we bring in, some of which we uh, actually try to exclude and keep out. So if you assume that therefore that um, houses are part of nature, then how do you evaluate housing? I've spent a lot of time trying to use ideas like uh, well-being, uh, human well-being, to evaluate housing. Um, but what about the others involved? What about the animals and materials? Can you use the ideas of well-being uh, in terms of animals as well? Can you use it in terms of materials? Is there uh, such a thing as well-being of material? And that's what I've been trying to do. One of the kind of current uh, terms that we tend to use is the term of sustainability, and I was talking about it with one of you earlier. Um, and that is supposed to take involve some of these kinds of issues, but it's actually a totally human concept. So if you take the idea of sustainability to its extreme, you could wipe out all the other species of animals. You could deplete the world of uh, resources unless they helped humans. And it seems to me that as a moral and ethical position, that is not appropriate. So it's not really a concept that I think is very useful and we're looking at these um, ideas. Now one of the, as I said, uh, this is based on a book, this talk, and one of the problems with that is that you can go off on tangents. And part of the literature I'm spending a lot of time looking at is um, the work on intelligence and uh, behavior in animals. And it is fascinating, <laughs> absolutely fascinating work, which I think can, has the potential, it certainly changed my views of humans and what they are and what animals are, but also changes, I think, as uh, so I'll get through to, uh, against our notion of what is science. And a lot of this work is that in intelligence so it's arguing against this idea that somehow humans are unique and that when we've tried to study animals, we've tended to look for human traits in animals and we've found that there are there. You can uh, teach certain animals, if you like, to perform tricks that we as humans uh, would recognize. But there's actually um, a lot more to intelligence of animals, to the agency of animals, than we uh, know about or actually give credit to because a lot of their abilities uh, are abilities which we don't have necessarily the sensory capacity to understand ourselves. So this, uh, and also there's, there's quite a lot of very interesting work on intelligence and how we build up intelligence and how we relate and learn. So again, the classic dichotomy is that humans have culture so that we learn socially through education, that animals have instinct and they behave on those kinds of instincts. But a lot of the recent work is trying to, uh, showing that those, that dichotomy is not 
correct, and that animals and humans both learn in relation to their environment, and uh, what some people have called umwelt. So, for example, my favorite example of this is beavers. Um, we would tend to think that beavers build dams because it's somehow it's genetically uh, programmed to do it. But the research has shown that actually beavers learn how to build dams and lodges. And they learn it from their parents and it's almost, if you like, socially programmed. And, and this actually, how do we learn as individuals? There's uh, quite a lot of interesting work being uh, looked at our relationship to our environment and people have built educational um, theories on the basis of that. And the fact that we learn in terms of our constant interaction with our environment, with our uh, umwelt. And you can take this even further down to plants. One of the things that uh, intrigued me was apparently uh, if you um, if you actually um, record the sound of a uh, butterfly or an insect and play it to a certain plant, the plant will move and it will actually have various kind of chemical reactions. Um, so they have senses, uh, amazingly. <laughs> so, I mean, the general point that I'm trying to make here is that we are part of this kind of system. We are not necessarily unique. The places that we live in are not necessarily unique with their cohabitations, with all other uh, materials, with all other plants and animals. And we uh, have more in common with them than we think we have. And if you take this argument down to things like materials, how do you uh, use the idea of agency of something like a monsoon, for example? I mean, some people have taken that as being a research study based on monsoon as an assemblage. It's a connection of a set of activities. Um, a monsoon has agency. It, it brings about various impacts. Materials do exactly the same. So if you're looking at housing, my argument is, and you're accepting it as part of nature, you need to actually look at those kind of connections between these different elements, and they all have agency and different parts uh, of agency, different types of agency. And I love the bit about trees as well. Uh, that apparently trees communicate with each other through their roots and they can put over, if they are threatened, then they can put uh, danger signs uh, through uh, and to let other trees know that uh, there's danger around. So, is housing a, a, an appropriate focus for us to study all of this? Because I suppose what I left out really in that argument is that our living in particular places um, draws out all of these kind of connections. We have connections with materials, with animals, and wherever we live. What, what we do has impacts on animals, and what animals do has impact uh, on us. It's not just the... Uh, deer that comes down and sleeps on my lawn and eats all my vegetables. It's, it's uh, other kinds of uh, animals and materials in our lives, as I said, some of which we bring in. And it has implications, I think, for all of our studies of housing. We're talking about housing affordability, homelessness. I know people who are homeless and live on the streets because they have uh, a pet animal, which is very important to them in terms of their psychological well-being but that means they can't then go into shelters because they have that animal. What kind of environment are we creating in homeless shelters, for example? Um, what kind of materials are used? Uh, what are we putting across to the humans that we're putting in that situation? So I think the idea of a house or a home is far too narrow and human focused. So we need a term that's inclusive of uh, the dwelling itself, its structure, the inhabitants of the structure, and the context, the environment, the umwelt of that structure. Now, some people have used the term dwelling. Architects use the term dwelling in general and, and jump on the work of Heidegger. Um, but Heidegger wrote about that much about dwelling. It was just one piece. And as a social scientist looking at it, I would argue it's actually uh, not very rigorous in terms of what he uh, 
has uh, written. And there's some much more interesting work since then, particularly the work, I think, of Tim Ingold, um, looking at uh, notions of, of dwelling, um, which, which really deserves uh, a look. I prefer the term inhabitation. And it's a personal choice between those. I think you can use either term to include the kinds of things I'm talking about. Um, and what I like about inhabitation, it, uh, we can use it about an individual dwelling or a settlement. You can talk about inhabiting a city. You can talk, talk about inhabiting a structure or inhabitation in the structure. It tends not to assume that there's a fixed physical building, which I think the term dwelling, used as a noun, does. And in that sense, you can talk about a homeless person inhabiting a street doorway. Um, you can talk about um, animals having inhabitation. They inhabit a particular space. And it opens up the idea of cohabitation, uh, the idea that we're always there inhabiting uh, with others. So it can be used with humans and, habit and animals. I like the link that it has to the term habitat which is what we're thinking of as being the environment within which people live. And I also, as I'll get on to talk about the idea of practices, I like its link to the idea of habitus, the Bourdieu's idea of habitus, and this idea that when we look at these things, we need to look at them in terms of both agency and structure. So it brings ideas of power into those kinds of relationships. So what I'm talking about is living practices the practices that we have which surround um, our inhabitation. And the key concept I want to kind of put forward, which is my third proposition, is the idea of inhabitation practices. Now, first, I have to have just a, a bit of a slight onto uh, ideas of uh, assemblage and actor network theory. Sociologists or some geographers will uh, recognize some elements of what I've talked about here as being parts of those theories. Um, I haven't got time to go into them in any kind of depth at all, as you can imagine. I'm not sure I'm going over time already. Um, but my question about them is that um, they haven't caught on in our kind of areas of housing studies in particular, I can't really think of a study which has actually managed to use those concepts and use them uh, particularly well. So the pros, I think what I like about those kind of approaches is that uh, they look at the agencies of all of the, what they call actants, human animals, materials. Um, they look at the networks or interconnections between all of those. And they're attentive to both the individual elements and the collective whole. So one of the important things, I think, is to look at each of the individual elements in a network or an assemblage or a practice and understand uh, them as an individual element, but also understand the interconnections between them. The problems, I think, that with that connect work theory and assemblage, and I'm probably really annoying some people in terms of um, what I'm saying about that, is that I find a lot of assemblage theory is very descriptive, anecdotal, uh, and it's a very kind of indiscriminate approach. Some people have described it as being just empiricism gone mad, that you're just in their mapping all of these different connections, what's significant, what is trivial, you don't know, you have no way of finding that from the first. Um, a lot of assemblage theories where they have any idea of, of uh, power um, tend to have a very dispersed idea of power, that all power is dispersed in these interconnected networks. And you could read all the work of Latour, for example, and you will never see the word power in his work. So it seems to me that there is a lot left out. Um, and where do you stop? I've never known any kind of study of assemblage or actor network theory. It, they just go on forever because you're basically asked to go on and chart all these different kind of networks. 
They also, and what I'll get onto right at the end of the flow, it's got flaws of systems theory. And I'll, I'll talk about that in terms of Wilbur's uh, context. Um, and there's almost no impact on policy from uh, assemblage or actor network theories because um, you know, you're kind of lost in this morass of data, I think, and there's no clear recommendations that you as a, a researcher can uh, come up with. So that's a very, very brief <laughs> um, summing up of actor network and assembly theories that some people have spent their whole lives and whole careers looking at. So I apologize for how brief that is, but it, it sets the scene really for how I want to develop those, I think, which is actually taking up the idea of, of practices and what had been called social practices, although I argue that that's an inappropriate uh, term. And the idea of practices goes back to the work of Giddens and Bourdieu, uh, uh, you know, incorporates ideas of structuration. And the idea, therefore, is that we all undertake certain kind of practices. Some of those we continue, and then we're restructuring that practice. It becomes a kind of structural element, some of which we change, we do things differently, and that actually restructures it, kind of creates a different uh, practice. And I put up this, uh, I won't read it up, but it's a very long definition of um, practices, which, of course, I could go into it in great detail and pick apart certain elements of it and say, oh, I'd like to refine this, I'd like to refine that, uh, but I won't do. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, practices in hab habitation, practices in general, and then I'll try to convince you about it by actually looking at a couple of examples. I think um, I used um, practices, social practice theory, uh, a lot in my early work. So the, the, the whole idea of a housing pathway is based on the idea of uh, social practices. Um, but when I went back to that literature, maybe 10 or 15 years later, I was uh, surprised about how it had taken on this material turn, if you like. The ideas of, of actor network theory and assemblage theory had seeped into uh, practice theory. So <clears throat> modern practice theory, recent practice theory, uh, has, is expanded to include humans, animals, and materials. You can look at issues of consumption and production, and I'll try to give examples of both of those later. A lot of the studies that have been done in housing of, uh, using the idea of practices are focused on housing consumption and things like energy use. Um, but um, you can look at production practices as well to look at. It does bring out this idea of the interconnections when uh, you're pursuing a practice, you're involved with animals, and material elements all the time, um, but it also so it looks at the agent, if you like. It looks at the agency of the different elements of that. It provides a missing social theory, which isn't there in a lot of assemblage or actor network theories, it, um, through the ideas of structuration, the way that is uh, change, and those things that actually influence practices. It's integrative uh, in the sense that you look at all of these different elements Okay, that's in general terms. Got two examples really of um, of the practices approach used in the way that uh, I'm suggesting it should be used. One is uh, areas where it has been used a fair amount, and another one is areas which I'm suggesting we could use it far more of. So there's a, a lot of work being done on so-called homemaking practices, what we do to make a home in a particular situation. And the kinds of things that are involved in making a home, things like cooking, bathing, relaxation, and so on. Now again, I've already let on how old I am from how long I've been uh, with Friends of the Earth, but even more, I'll now say I was actually born in a house um, which, <laughs> that may be a revelation that I was born in a house. Um, but this house um, had no bathroom. Um, it had no toilet. The toilet was at the end of the yard, so you had to go outside, go to the toilet. It actually had no 
mechanism for heating hot water. Um, you had no hot water on tap. So basically, you had to boil up uh, water for whatever you were using. So the idea then of bathing, for me, as my mother brought me up, was that um, it took place in a, this iron tub in front of a coal fire uh, with water that was boiled up in various kind of uh, kettles. And you did it once a week. And the soap you used for that bathing was the same soap that my mother used to, to wash the clothes with as well. And it came in these huge, great lumps, uh, which you could hew off little bits of, of it. So I really am showing up my age now, aren't I? Uh, and they're, they're, actually, when I was born, they were still rationing sweets, which I was very, very annoyed about, as you can imagine. What, <laughs> what has changed? Uh, an awful lot has changed, isn't it? The idea of our bathing practices. I now live in a house with three bathrooms. Uh, and we learned the idea that you um, do have a bathroom for every uh, bedroom we have. I do, you'll be very grateful to know, I do actually bathe every day now um, and shower every day, um, <laughs> at least. <laughs> and we're used to, again, doing that. You know, we go back and we have a shower. Now, what's actually changed in terms of those practices? Well, a lot has changed, doesn't it? And it's, it is this relationship between the uh, human and the material in this particular instance. I'll show you how animals come into it. But what's changed is the technology. So we have the technologies, we have the material elements there now to heat water. We have the standard of living that we can afford to use those uh, materials. Um, and we've built our houses around uh, those ideas and those uh, materials. We, um, materials that we use like soaps, of course, are different. I, whenever even I go into a hotel room, I'm absolutely um, amazed at all the different materials that one can now use um, to, uh, other than my bar of soap that I had when I was a child. Uh, and there's lots of marketing that goes into those uh, materials. And of course, those materials have impact in terms of where they've come from, the materials that they've used, the energy that they've used, uh, and uh, so on. And we have different social norms about bathing, about what is appropriate, maybe how, what we think about body, body odor as, as something that's appropriate in social situations. So you can see how here you've got a social practice which brings together material. Where, where do the animals come in? Well, people use the showers to to clean their dogs, don't they? And there are various kind of, I seem to spend whenever I, which is not often, whenever I clean my shower area or whatever, um, there are uh, various kind of molds and whatever around it. Um, we have to make sure it's disinfected. We have different views about various kind of microbes and how useful or not they are. So our ideas of cleanliness have changed um, tremendously in that time. Now, to look at that change and how it's occurred, the practices approach gives you this way of looking at those interactions. And, and it's in those interactions that the important changes occur. So we tended to spend a lot of time looking at certainly, say, the technical aspects of those and not necessarily at the relationship between the technical aspects. And to give a, another related example, the idea of heating in houses. Uh, again, there are technologies involved in that, but again, a lots of interesting uh, work about notions of comfort. And uh, in my local housing association where I'm on the board, we've had these very interesting debates about uh, the fact that uh, quite a few of our tenants at the moment live in houses that are difficult to heat. They have very expensive heating systems, uh, electrical storage heaters and so on. What happens if we put in air source heat pumps or more uh, efficient heating systems, more environmentally friendly heating systems? Uh, well, the answer is we don't know. Uh, we think that what will happen actually and it's, we'll just heat their houses up to the same level that they had before, or, or, or rather, sorry, they won't heat them up to the same level. What they'll do is spend the same amount of money on heating and electricity as they did before, but heat their houses up to higher levels. And where animals come into this is quite interesting because when people are asked about what is important in their home, animals seem to 
Domestic pets come up quite highly. Domestic pets have ways of telling you whether they're cold or they're warm. Uh, they have levels of heating, whether it's your cat that's done was on the radiator or whatever. So they play a part in the decision making within a ho household about what the level of heating is. So they are part of the inhabitation practice because they, they inhabit that space as well. So my argument is to understand any of them. If we're it's interested in issues, why quite a lot of people are for obvious reasons about energy consumption houses, we need to look at all of these interconnections and practices gives us a good way of doing that and we can zoom in and zoom out of uh, which is a term used in social practices so you can focus on the individual practice itself and then take the different elements and trace them back so where do the materials come from that make the shower um, what kind of embedded energies is uh, involved in those, what kind of materials do they use, what is the impact of using those materials on other locations. Um, it's, there's quite an interesting uh, literature that's been done on cement and the use of concrete and uh, I don't know whether some of you have come across that but apparently uh, concrete has been used, uh, has been available as a building material for a very very long time but there was a big uh, difficulty with its take up and the reason for that was that it needed a whole kind of in infrastructure it needed a whole set of uh, social practices to allow to produce mass produced con concrete on a site at a particular period of time why are we still using concrete because we know it uses a lot of embedded energy we know that it's very harmful in terms of the um, sites where um, it's, it's extracted from because I think those social practices around uh, the use of concrete are so well embedded and need to be redone. Yep. <laughs> so it's not quite that, but almost, yeah. Move on. And w one of the, in terms of the production, one of the things that I'm very trying to push quite hard is the idea of the building site as a focus of research. Because the building site, where we construct dwellings, is actually where a lot of social practices come together. And these social, you can look at them individually through the social practices of, of professional groups like architects, uh, the organizations that are involved, they all come together uh, on a building site. And that building site uses materials, it uses materials in the actual construction, it uses materials to build uh, the houses through the use of machines and so on and all of those have implications again to understand what is going on in terms of what our houses look like we need to look at how those social practices um, interrelate and we can zoom in and zoom out we can look at the particular building sites and then we can take elements of it and look at the different elements just as I've got to wind up, I've come to the really controversial bit. <clears throat> so that if we're actually going to uh, do this um, analysis of these interrelations, how do we do it? Because how do you bring together the analysis of materials and technologies with the analysis of human and, and animal um, behavior? And this is where I uh, like the work of uh, Ken Wilber. And I'll bring it up. Now, what I think is, is particularly useful. Ken Wilber had a whole kind of social life, if you like, a view of how life is and has evolved. He's a, a, an environmentalist. Uh, yes, he, he's into kind of future studies. I'm trying to think of the term which he would call himself, but he's a philosopher that's very interested in, in how um, we have evolved and we uh, moved on. Some of his theories I don't uh, ascribe to. Uh, when I was giving a talk um, recently on this uh, actually in Luxembourg, and, and somebody said that followers of Wilbur are like followers of a sect or a cult, that you kind of either uh, go 100% with him or you, uh, uh, you don't. And uh, if you start challenging people who do accept his views, then uh, it, c it can get quite vicious. Um, but I don't accept his general views, but I think this is really, really interesting. He basically says, uh, and it's a form of what people have called um, 
monism, the idea that there is only one science. And he says that everything is made up of holons, what he calls holons. Holons are things which are holes uh, and uh, parts of other holes at the same time. And he looks at those as a kind of hierarchy. So what he says is that everything that we look at has these four levels, these four uh, quadrants. On the left here are the interior. So he's uh, looking actually within the holon. And these are things that, uh, first is, is the agency. The interior of the human is maybe their uh, bodily, and I'm trying not to use the word mind, but the kind of mind and body um, agency. Um, getting hermeneutics is what we generally use, a kind of uh, qualitative research technique to get inside. Um, the collective element, so that single uh, along the top, interior is, is about individual agency. The collective is about cultural ideas of uh, social norms, ideas of discourses, general collective behavior. And for each of those, you have to get inside the holon. Now, there are really interesting things. One of the reasons I <coughs> went in earlier to a lot of talk about animals and materials is the difficulty of doing that with animals and materials. Um, but it can be done, I think, and there are ways which have been brought forward to do that. The exterior is what we think of as being positivist. It's looking from the outside at the holon, and it's kind of looking at the behavior, and we're used to doing that in terms of individual, looking at individual behavior, and we're used to using it in terms of looking at collective behavior, usually through the ideas of systems and systems theory. And this is where I... Uh, take against ideas like an ecosystem, because if you're looking at something like an ecosystem, you're taking a very much uh, an outside, exterior view of a collection without understanding what the individual internal elements of that are. Now, to take that further, what Wilbur says is that there are diff for each of those different quadrants, those ways of looking at it, there are different assessment criteria. So there's no idea of what is good science, um, but there are different views. So in other words, we shouldn't be looking for just one idea of how we can evaluate things. We should be uh, looking at many. And he says, any study, all of those quadrants will be there. So that we should look at all of those quadrants in anything that we do. So to sum up, you'll be relieved to know. So my argument has been that anything we do in what we call housing involves human, animal and material elements. It includes all of Wilbur's quadrants, the things that we need to look at. I've put forward the idea of the practices framework as a way in which we can do that, that we can look at all of these different elements and bring them together. And I argued this is what housing research should be. It should be about inhabitation, and it should be using these kind of ideas. And I'll leave you with this quote from Bridle, which I will read out because I think it's so important. A very or depends upon our ability to make a new compact with the more than human world, one which views the intelligence, the innate being of all things, animal, vegetable, and machine, not as another indication of our own superiority, but as an intimation of our ultimate interdependence, and as an urgent call to humility and care, which I think brings home just the, let's see, of actually changing the way that we look at the world. And this has probably been far too long, but if you need any more information on this, uh, it will be in this book, which is published in March. And please do buy it. I need the money. So. <laughs> Thank you very much.